Ich möchte Ihnen jetzt unsere erste Referentin vorstellen. Sie kommt aus Israel und sie ist ein absoluter Topshot. Mit 15 hat sie beschlossen, dass sie Hackerin werden möchte. Und zwar hat sie damals den Film Hackers gesehen mit Angelina Jolie. Ich finde ja, der Haircut erinnert mich immer noch so ein bisschen an Angelina Jolie. Sie hat also beschlossen, Hackerin zu werden. Sie war schon immer fasziniert von Technologie, von funky thinking und von Hackers. Today, she is a globally known cybersecurity expert. She works for companies, she works for um, countries. She has, she has a relation with the Tel Aviv University, with a think tank in Silicon Valley, and she was also working for NATO uh, concerning cybersecurity. Now she's here, and we welcome her very much to Zurich, Karen Elasari. Thank you. Hi, Karen. Thank you so, so good much. to have you here. What a lovely introduction, Christine. I tried my best. Thank you so much. I have to tell you, just uh, in the order of transparency, I was only invited uh, to the NATO Cyber Center three times. So I haven't worked for them. I gave them my advice for free. And um, I haven't been invited since. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm sure they want me to come back soon. So uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be with you here today. Uh, let me ask you a theoretical question. What if I told you that in 10 seconds I could take over your computer, generate thousands of dollars worth of cryptocurrencies, all while you're drinking your morning coffee? You might think it's impossible, but this is exactly what happened in Argentina earlier this year. The customers of Starbucks discovered that when they walk into a Starbucks in Argentina and they try to log into the free Wi-Fi, as you know, Starbucks offers free Wi-Fi all over the world, Instead of getting the regular landing page, their computer waits exactly 10 seconds. One curious security researcher decided to look into the reason of this delay. After looking at what happens on his computer, he discovered that for those 10 seconds, his computer was actually running a little bit of JavaScript. Specifically, it was running something called CoinHive. CoinHive is a type of distributed cryptocurrency mining software that was running on everybody's machine whenever they walked into a Starbucks in Argentina and tried to log into the Wi-Fi. It actually generated a lot of money, or a lot of Monero, which is the cryptocurrency it was mining. What's really interesting is that the criminal behind this didn't even have to create the code or create the JavaScript. All he had to do was really get the code from somebody else. This code, CoinHive, is actually a company, and you can even buy it from them. It is a product, and the business model is that it allows anybody to monetize the user's CPU. So if you have a website, for example, you are a news site, and you, are, you want to charge people for money, and nobody wants to pay the subscription because the print and media is going away, and everybody <laughs> expects news sites for free, a lot of the times you might get this ad that says, please turn off your ad blocker. The ads are what allow us to give you the free access to news sites. There are actually some news sites in the United States right now that are looking at putting this coin hiving solution as an alternative to paying for the news. So this is just a very short story, but it is an example of the creative technologies that even cyber criminals can generate, completely new business models, and all while you're drinking your morning coffee. In our session today, it's going to be a very fast journey into the world of hackers, the criminals and the friendly hackers like me. And I will be your guide for this journey because it's true, I started my path in the hackers world more than 20 years ago. It might be a little bit difficult for you, though, to identify me in this school photo. I did show up to school this day, and I am in the photo, but I was so much of a nerd that I was this kid. You didn't see that coming, huh? <laughs> True story. I was so much of a nerd that even the boys playing Dungeons and Dragons wouldn't allow me to join their team. And I spent a lot of my time, instead of school friends, I had computer friends and gadgets and robots that I would take apart. I'd spend a lot of time in the computer lab at uh, the school. And when we got the internet in Israel in 1993, 
I didn't know exactly what the internet was, but I knew I had to get it. So I begged my mom, and within a few weeks, I was already teaching myself how to code. I wrote like HTML, very simple code, and how to get into other people's websites and computers, which was the most interesting thing for me, because I was always really curious, and I had questions I couldn't find the answers to, unless I got on that website and that forum or that server. When I was about 15, I discovered that this is called being a hacker. And I discovered it because of Angelina Jolie. And she starred in this Hollywood film, and she portrayed this really cool girl in high school, which was part of a group of hackers that could do pretty much anything. And the movie wasn't very realistic, because back in the day, 95, the hackers, you know, they took over the traffic light system, they hacked into the FBI director's emails, uh, they could take over pretty much anything they wanted. Things that are today happening were not really possible back then. But what I really took from this film was the idea that the high school hackers, the weirdos, the nerds, they can actually be the heroes of the story. And it might be a girl like me who is a part of it. So that's what I decided to do with my life. Since then, I work with a variety of organizations, always trying to think like the friendly hacker. What would the hacker hero do? These are just some of the companies, the agencies, and the organizations that I worked with. And in the past five years, I spent my time with academic institutions like Tel Aviv University and Singularity University in California. By the way, if you've ever been, if, sorry, if you've never been to Tel Aviv, I'd like to extend a friendly invitation. I happen to run one of the biggest hacker community events in Israel. It takes place each summer in June. It's a free event. It's called B-Sides TLV. And the weather is guaranteed to be sunny or your money back. <laughs> Did I mention it's a free conference? Well, you are all welcome to join me there. But if you don't want to travel all the way to Tel Aviv, there is actually a B-Sides even here in Zurich happening in September. Because B-Sides is part of a global network of hacker community events, which takes place anywhere from Sao Paulo to Las Vegas. So please save the date. I'd like to see you in Tel Aviv. But the main reason I'm here, and I'll give you some good reasons to come and meet those friendly hackers, because I know you're still a little bit skeptical that hackers can actually help, is this theory I developed a few years ago that the friendly hackers and the security researchers actually are an integral part. They are part of what makes us safe. They could be our immune system for this new digital era that in which we create new technologies all the time, and that we actually need these types of people and individuals that think differently. Sometimes even the bad guys can find a new type of technology or a new use case that nobody has ever imagined before. Let me show you a few examples. Why do we even need an immune system, by the way, you might ask? Well, in this day and age, in fact, no organization stands by themselves. We are all part of a large ecosystem. You might imagine this as some biological cell or something like this, but this picture is actually a visualization of what the World Wide Web looked like maybe 10 years ago. Now we have this ever-expanding universe of digital assets. In fact, many of us have probably more devices than immediate family members in our home. Do the math. I think quite a lot of you will find that you have more iPads and gadgets than you might have pets living with you. In fact, according to the Munich Security Conference, they released a report just last month. They're expecting that in this year, 2018, there are already going to be about double the amount of devices than there are humans on this planet. And this is not going to change. So we definitely do need an immune system for this new digital universe because it is expanding without a stop. Now, these devices could be used to spy on you, and I hope you have a piece of tape on your webcam, like Christine did. But even if you have put a tape on your webcam, which is very good, your webcam could still get hacked. Not to take pictures of you, not to spy in, on you, but actually to hack other people's computers. This is exactly what happened two years ago. You may have heard about this massive internet denial of service attack. It was called Mirai. And over the course of a weekend, it took down websites all over the world. Websites like uh, Airbnb and news sites and Amazon, really big websites, retail sites. So when they are down, they're actually losing money. And this attack was actually supercharged by so many devices in people's homes, devices that were used for a denial of service attack, 
because they were using basic internet protocols like DNS, for example, which can be subverted, which is what happened in this attack. And the worst of all, a default username and password combination. In fact, for many of them, this was the password and user combination. You are laughing, but check exactly the devices in your home. Did you all recycle or change the, app, the password and the uh, definitions on the new webcam or router or whatever it is new gadget that you have in your home? Maybe you here in the room did it because you're security professionals or you are aware, but did your family members do it, your colleagues, your clients, your partners? The reality is that more companies and businesses are starting to have you know, IoT, the Internet of Things, devices in their business, cameras and routers that can be hacked and then hack other organizations. So your business could actually be blamed for being a part of such an attack. And this is happening not because criminals might necessarily target you or target anyone with a camera. Criminals have found very creative, very fast, automatic ways to identify devices that they can use and they will utilize any resource online. It will just become part of their digital army. Speaking of which, even an aquarium, a fish tank, was hacked recently. Now, you might think, how is this even possible? Where a very big North America casino installed a very big fish tank so that they would entertain the people that are visiting the casino, and they wanted it to be smart because they are a digital business, they're up to date. There was smart sensors checking the temperature and the feeding schedules of the fish and uh, the salinity of the water, all of these details. Now you might think, okay, well, this has nothing to do with the you know, poker games on the floor of the casino or the data of people participating. You are correct. However, this fish tank was connected to the internet. And so the criminals who managed to already hack the casino network use the outgoing connection of the aquarium to send out 10 gigabytes of data that they were stealing from the casino. And because the data was going over this connection of the aquarium, there was no firewall or nobody was noticing it. Actually, uh, one company did notice it, and this is why I know about it. It was discovered by some very clever uh, self-learning algorithms that were able to identify that this outgoing traffic doesn't really make sense with the regular operation of a smart aquarium. This is the sort of skill set for which security professionals will, will utilize automated algorithms and machine learning. Because it's very difficult for a security professional to immediately understand how a specific technology can be used. I don't expect you all to be experts in fish tanks. Perhaps you, sir, right? You are smiling because you have an aquarium at home, I think. <laughs> but imagine the next technology that your office will now adopt. Doesn't matter if it's smart printers or smart coffee machines. Nobody should be expected to know how these technologies work, and yet they could be useful for the criminals against us. Here's a tool that you can all use for free to find out if you do have internet connected or internet uh, accessible devices in your home or your office environment. It is called Shodan, like the black belt in karate. It is a search engine for connected devices. And I keep mentioning it, although it's been around since 2009, I still know that people don't know it. It's a very valuable tool, both for the criminals, but also for you to understand what's going on in your organization. And you don't have to go on the dark net to use it. It's actually quite simple, give it a try. Now, I wanna move on to the next type of attack or the next type, type of way that criminals will take advantage of your digital resources to make money. And this is, of course, the type of attack called ransomware, which I'm sure you've heard of in the past year or two. Uh, who here has had to actually deal with ransomware in their home or office? Quite a few of you, and I bet even more, but once again, like with Christine's question earlier, perhaps you are concerned of your reputation and you don't want to mention it. I don't think we should shame organizations for having to deal with ransomware because it, because it is a little bit like the flu in a sense that these attacks are designed to propagate and infect as many computers as they can. Now, one of the biggest ransomware attacks uh, in the previous years was when criminals encrypted the data drives, the computers in a hospital in Hollywood. And that's when the, the criminals actually discovered they have a really successful business case. They might hack personal people's computers and they might pay a little bit, a small ransom to get their files back, but actually the success rate was you know, under 10% or even under 1% of people paying the ransom. But if they go after big organizations where the data actually 
is critical for life and death operations of the business, like a hospital, they would probably get paid within three or four hours. And that's exactly what happened. Actually, luckily for this hospital, when they paid it, the Bitcoin, Bitcoin uh, rate for the dollar was actually quite low. So they only had to pay $17,000. Today, ransomware attacks could cost organizations a lot more. In fact, I'm sure you heard about the wave of attacks called WannaCry, which infected computers all over the world, even the computer systems of the German rail organization. These are the information systems in German train stations. Uh, a Renault Nissan factory was shut down uh, in France because of such an attack. And the biggest, the biggest really victim of this particular attack called WannaCry, the biggest victim was the UK National Health Services. According to them, about 30% of the national health services, that means hospitals and emergency rooms and clinics and doctors, 30% of them were not operating because they were under such an impact from a devastating ransomware attack. This attack called WannaCry was actually determined by the UK government to be in a high probability directed by North Korea. Now, this is really interesting. You might think, why would a country like North Korea want to launch such a campaign on European nations. I, I, I spent some time researching this and thinking about this, and I have uh, three possible explanations. One explanation is that this is a country that thrives in the presence of chaos and confusion, and that actually acts unexpectedly sometimes to create some dynamic that they could benefit from in the world according to their ideology. My second theory was that they really need the money because they are under sanctions, and so they really need Bitcoin and payments for ransomware to fund their continuous efforts to create uh, uh, nuclear weapons, etc. My third theory is that actually it was an accident and that they created a very, very effective piece of ransomware which got much more effective than they imagined it would become. And it infected so many computers much more than their original target. We may never know the answer, but uh, we do know that there are groups in North Korea that are very heavily specializing in attacking financial institutions, which might have relevance for you here in the room today. The Lazarus Group, uh, so-called by the Kaspersky company, that's how Kaspersky called them, is one group which specializes in attacking financial institutions. You may have heard about the attack on the SWIFT infrastructure and SWIFT servers in the past year, and the theft of about $80 million from the Central Bank of Bangladesh. In fact, they were trying to steal a lot more. So this goes a little bit to strengthen the assumption that the North Koreans do need money because of the financial sanctions, and that, that might be one reason behind it. However, I think uh, that the story is never simple when it comes to cyber attackers. And uh, as we will see from the next example, sometimes the motivations of a nation or a nation state actor can be hidden behind what seems like a financial or criminal activity. For example, the very destructive Wiper attack called NotPetya, which came around one month after WannaCry. Now, this is the epicenter of where that attack began. This is a small data center, if you can call it a data center. See, it's very sophisticated. Particularly, I love their uh, state-of-the-art cooling system with the fan. By the way, when I was young and overclocking my PC, I had exactly the same time, type of cooling solution. Uh, I would just open the, the computer and put a fan on it. But this is actually the real data center of a small company in the Ukraine. This is a company that does something very specific. They do tax accounting software. And a large percentage of Ukrainian companies use their tax accounting software to report their taxes. Now, the story with this small company is really interesting because apparently the company was hacked for over two years, and what was specially manipulated was their software update mechanism. So that means every time some Ukrainian customer of theirs updated the software, they also got a little bit of malicious software from whoever the attackers were, an attacker that is interested in getting into Ukrainian companies in particular. So if this was going on for two years, what happened suddenly in May or June 2017 to cause this epidemic of a wiper attack? This is really interesting because actually the attack looked like it was ransomware. So it would encrypt people's computers and would request a ransom, some small 
payment in Bitcoin or something like that to get the files back. But actually, there was no possible way to get access to the file. It wasn't a ransomware at all. It was a wiper that destroys major parts of the master boot record of the computer and makes it impossible to restore any of the files there. So if it's not a ransomware attack and it's not a financially motivated attack, what could be the reason? One theory that has been brought up was that actually whoever was hacking that tax company in the Ukraine wanted to create an effective virus that would destroy the evidence of everything they had been doing for two years in a bunch of Ukrainian companies. In fact, it may have again been an accident that it also infected so many other computers around the world, further to the ones that were originally the target of these attackers, whoever they might be. Now, I have some theories about who they might be. But the interesting fact with this attack, regardless of its motivations, is that very big companies that may have nothing to do with the Ukraine or nothing to do with uh, these financially motivated attackers actually got hit. This is, for example, the automated shipping terminal in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. It is almost fully automated. There are very few humans working in this shipping terminal. It's operated by a company called Maersk. I'm sure you've heard of them. And they actually suffered such devastation from this particular attack that they recently uh, announced in their financial reports the costs are $300 million in losses. And this is from four days of being unable to operate their shipping terminal because their computers were hit by this virus. What this story tells me is that your organization, or any organization in fact, might be a target of uh, a criminal campaign, but you might even not be a target and still get hit as a collateral damage, but very, very costly collateral damage as we've seen in this case. Here's another company that was impacted by it, completely out of the blue. This is a company in the US uh, that manufactures medications. It's a pharmaceutical company. And one of the things they do is actually create vaccines against viruses like hepatitis virus. So vaccines against, against human viruses. And their operations were impacted. So there was a shortage of the particular vaccine that they developed. So imagine a situation where a computer virus is actually causing the propagation of human viruses. And in fact, all because of out of, out of life, out of scope operating systems. Because th these are some of the operating systems that were most impacted in these attacks. And when I say they are out of life or end of life, that means that the company, Microsoft in this case, no longer supports them. So they no longer create software updates and patches for software vulnerabilities. To make the story even more complicated, the software vulnerability that was being used in both of these attacks, in the wiper and the ransomware that was before that, the vulnerability was one that was codenamed Eternal Blue. Who gave them such a beautiful code name? The NSA. So this was actually a cyber weapon, if you will, developed and discovered by the NSA that was stolen by the US agency in charge of security. Can? Yeah, that's their name, the National Security Agency. They couldn't keep track of their own cyber weapons. And in fact, it led to this widespread global epidemic. And who stole it from them? Well, again, a very shadowy group of criminals and hackers calling themselves the shadow brokers. Who are they? Who do they work for? Again, I have some ideas. But what this story sh shows to me is that you can never be very clear on who is behind the attack. Sometimes the digital weapon is one that was developed by one organization, stolen from them, then leaked by a different group of hackers, and finally utilized by criminals or countries for a variety of reasons. The real goal of the attacker might be camouflaged and not in clear sight. In fact, in the age of cyber cold war that we already live in, there are certain countries that engage actively in this sort of deception and misdirection. You may have heard in the news recently of uh, some allegations against particular countries. My point to you here today is that it's not very clear who is standing in the forefront or on the front lines of the battlefield. It's not just cyber warriors working for this country or that country or that agency. In fact, many organizations, even you here in the room, you're the ones on the front lines because it will be your company or your organization that could be implicated in the next attack. 
Now, just this week, we learned that there were ongoing attacks on one of the most secure networks of the German government, the so-called um, uh, Berlin-Bonn connection, which is supposed to be the most secure network used by the chancellor, the chancellery office, the foreign office, and to my understanding, also the defense ministry. And just yesterday, it was discovered that the attack was so, on, so ongoing for so many years, it may have still been active this week, whilst everybody was starting to discover it and, and to talk about the details of it. We still don't have a lot of information about how the attackers got in, in the first place, to this very secure network. I do have some theories, and it is my, at least my perspective, and it's very early in the story, we don't know a lot of the details, but it is my bet, even, I'm willing to bet some money, that there would be a human element in the equation. Because at the end of the day, even using the best technologies, we have humans clicking on links, or approving a new type of software, or connecting something that they should not have connected. Now, with all of these different stories that I told you, it is very complicated to make out the goal of the attackers, or sometimes even the identity. Is it a government located in Moscow, as one security report suggested this week? Is it the North Koreans? Is it criminals calling themselves the shadow brokers? It's very hard to tell. So I would suggest to you that when it comes to these global attacks and incidents, and when it comes to your organization, I would really suggest not to think about the impact on political elections or uh, the, the way that these things are tied, because you can spend a lot of time in the theories of who did it, why did they do it, how they look like, what kind of uniform do they wear, but really as an organization that needs to keep themselves safe, these questions are not that relevant. The more relevant questions are when is it going to happen to you or to your partners and colleagues that you work with? How are you going to find out about it? And then what you do? Because many of you, when asked how many of you were hacked, said, oh, not I, I didn't want to say, you know, you didn't want to admit it. But the reality is that perhaps more than 90%, if not 100% of organizations have to deal with cyber attacks. And if they are willing to admit it, that's a good step to get safer and to prepare and to build cyber resilience together. So uh, I want to give you a few more ideas before I move on to some things we can do about it. If I still have more time, yes? Okay. Well, you don't want to end up like this guy, right? You don't want to be extinct. And financial institutions definitely don't want to stay behind. You want to evolve. The, you have to evolve because the criminals are evolving. In the past year, we've seen that the criminals are not just inventing new techniques and new ways to attack organizations. They are evolving their methods. They go upstream. That means that instead of attacking an individual organization or one small company, they will go to a provider or some linked partnership or infrastructure. Case in point, that Ukrainian software company that I mentioned, for example. And not only that, they are going to use automation, they're going to build speed into the attacks so that they are spreading very wide. It becomes very difficult for single defensive teams to stop these types of attacks or to even identify them. They recycle the attacks, they use those types of uh, malware and exploits that have been used in different attacks in a deliberate effort to create the misdirection, the deception, the fog of war in a way the questions of whether this is Russia or North Korea or some other organization, they actually benefit from the lengthy discussion around it because it stops people from focusing on how to really prevent the next attack. And organizations that stand by themselves, that are not a part of an alliance, a partnership or a network, or that do not utilize the efforts and services that an organization like SIX, for example, can offer them, these are the organizations that will be the first ones to get devoured by the criminals or the first ones to become like the dinosaurs, if you will. Because by themselves, they are very vulnerable. But together, we are stronger. Especially when it comes to cybersecurity, my goal and my idea for you today is that building ecosystems where the friendly hackers also have a role to play makes everybody a lot safer. So a few ideas about how you can make yourself safer and your organization safer. Consider that every day you make hundreds of security decisions. When you input a recycled password instead of a new password, when you download an app that you shouldn't, when you connect something to a laptop of your workplace or at home, 
when, for example, you put in your credit card details in a little bit of a dodgy site and you say, oh, it's okay, nobody's interested in me. When you open the door to the office to somebody you don't know, and you are not the only ones making these security decisions. Your employees are making hundreds of security decisions every day. How can we make them or help them create better decisions? One thing is with the use of technology, and that's one uh, aspect we'll hear more about today, about how that is being used in the data center or the security center. But the better way to build that security culture into your people is by educating and giving them examples and even doing the experiments, sometimes called as uh, penetration testing, to show just how vulnerable an organization is. A few basic tenets or basic ideas for organizations to make themselves safer, things that they can do to actually help each other out. Sharing information about incidents and attacks that have happened. When you're asked, did something happen to your organization, instead of being shy or thinking first about your reputation, consider that by sharing the details with your partners in your network or through a trusted platform like Six, you are making everybody safer. You're stopping the next flu, if you will. Invest in talent and technology surrounding digital forensics and incident response, because this is the reply to how you will discover that something happened and how you will respond to it. When I mentioned that the questions are not who is behind it, but when, it ha when it's going to happen, how are you going to respond? The answer is by having a talent team of people that focus on incident response and digital forensics. I hope there are some of them here in the room today. And thirdly, develop that type of security culture. That cybersecurity is not just something for geeks and nerds, but actually it matters to each and every one of us. The one thing I'm very, very passionate about is the outsider's perspective. And that's something that a lot of organizations have learned in the past few years. By actually inviting and working with outside security experts, you can uncover those blind spots and those vulnerabilities that will be the criminal's paradise. And the way to do that is annually invite a red team or a penetration test to really look at your organization just like an attacker would. And a lot of the times, the red team people might look a little bit weird. They will be like me or, you know, they listen to heavy metal bands and wear black shirts. So what? That doesn't mean they're the bad guys. In fact, there actually might be your best chance to becoming safer. And m one of the things I am most passionate about is the adoption of bug bounty programs. Have anyone here heard about bug bounty programs in the past? Okay, some of you have, maybe a third or something like that. Well, I have a news flash. 100% of you here in the room today have already enjoyed the benefit of bug bounty programs. This is because so many organizations have decided to start a program like this, like this uh, organizations that have technologies that you rely on every day. What is a bug bounty program? It's an active effort by a company like Microsoft or Google or PayPal or Apple to actively ask hackers that find problems, that find security problems in their product, to report it and receive a reward. That's the bounty. Which companies I'm talking about? This is just a few examples, but it includes financial institutions like MasterCard, for example, Western Union. It includes technologies I'm sure you use, companies like Microsoft, Samsung, eBay, PayPal, Yahoo, the list goes on. A few really interesting organizations that have bug bounty programs. Tesla, one of the most innovative car companies in the world, perhaps just one of the most innovative companies, period, because everything they do is a little bit different. Four years ago, they decided to bring their flagship product, this is the Tesla Model S, they brought it to DEF CON, the world's largest convention of hackers. And they're actively hiring hackers, asking hackers to look at the security of their product, which includes a lot of technology, firmware, software, hardware, and they give out rewards. And the rewards are not just money. Sometimes there are symbolic rewards that are worth more than money in the hacker community. Medals, actual medals like this, which Tesla gives only to the top hackers that identify problems in their code. One of the guys that received this medal last year, by the way, is a guy called Mark Rogers. Uh, you may have never heard of him, but if you've seen the show Mr. Robot, he is one of the technical advisors to the show. And some of the things you see on the show were things that he has actually done. So that is a very worthy guy that we want to support and encourage. But here's a very different organization that decided to work with hackers. It's called the Pentagon. 
The United States Department of Defense realized that by actively inviting hackers to find problems in their open websites and unclassified systems, they can actually find really critical issues. From the moment they opened the program until they received the first valid report, 13 minutes. 13 minutes. I don't know if it's funny or sad, but what's even funnier is the rumor I heard it was a 13-year-old. And that's true, because in the program, they actually actively worked with young people who would never have a chance to work for an organization like this. And they already announced it as a massive success financially and technically, and launched similar programs for the Air Force and other US agencies. Here are some more hacker kids you want to encourage. When I go to a hacker convention, I don't see criminals. I see the future workforce needed for cybersecurity, because there is a massive skill gap in this space. And so the fact that there are kids that come to a hacker convention with their parents is really hopeful in my eyes to create that next generation of cyber defenders. But they don't have to go to a hacker convention. There is even another organization in the United States that now offers cybersecurity training, the Girl Scouts of America. So if you consider the idea of a Girl Scout, you probably think a Girl Scout is something, someone who is very mindful of the rules, someone who takes care of their community, someone who is not afraid to use their hands to build something, take something apart, create something new. Now in the US, it is also synonymous with a hacker, a friendly hacker who helps her community. This is a, a program that only began in the past year, and I hope it will go on for many years to, to come. Now, I want to finish with one last story. Uh, before I'm done. Uh, two years ago, at this big hacker convention in Las Vegas, there was a big competition sponsored by DARPA, the United States Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Uh, the grand prize was $2 million, and the competitors were seven machines, seven supercomputers in a challenge to hack each other. These were the actual machines. Just imagine you're in a big ballroom and you're looking at a hacking competition between completely automated supercomputers. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the winner. And I think it is also the future. This is the machine that won. Its name is Mayhem, and it is actually now in the American History Museum in Washington, DC. It's there as the first non-human to win a hacking competition. What a lot of people don't know, though, about this competition between machines and AIs, if I could call it AI, it's not exactly an AI, but we'll call it that for now. After it competed against the machines, it went on to graduate in a fight against human hackers. In 2017, the humans still won. That is good news, in case you're not sure. However, in the years to come, automation, machine learning, algorithms, AI, will be an integral part, not just of every aspect of society, but an integral part of cybersecurity. That's why I believe we actually need more such technologies and more humans that know how to work alongside and together with these automated creatures. If you look at the picture, it may look like they are fighting, but I like to imagine that maybe they are working together, collaborating. So if you share the same point of view that I suggested with you today, and you think that friendly hackers, technology, and building an ecosystem could be a good way to create safer society, I hope you decide to take the red pill <laughs> and wake up to this reality, because that's what I believe the future will bring. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks.